Welcome everybody who's here in person. Uh, welcome to those of you uh, joining us uh, online. I usually say when I, I look out into my audience of students, it seems like they get younger um, every day. And I'm, I'm not going to say anything about this audience, um, but uh, I'm glad to have you all here, uh, whatever your, your age. Um, it's my pleasure, or let me say who I am, uh, since you aren't my students, most of you. I'm Ben Valentino. I am a professor in the government department. I'm chair of the government department, actually. And I am the faculty director of the War and Peace Studies program here at the uh, Dickey Center for International Understanding. It's my pleasure this afternoon to introduce you to Philip Short. Uh, who is here to speak with us today about his latest book, which uh, is simply titled Putin. Um, no subtitle at all on this one. Um, that, that says it all. Um, uh, which was published this summer by Henry Holt. Um, needless to say, that's an extremely timely uh, book coming just at the time uh, that the entire world is trying to understand this man, Vladimir Putin. Uh, in the hopes of figuring out how to simultaneously save the people of Ukraine and not provoke a third world war. Fortunately, if there is anyone who might help us understand the mind of Vladimir Putin and how we might go about um, interacting with him, um, it's Philip, who has written previously uh, highly regarded uh, biographies, I think almost all of which I have read myself, on Mao, Pol Pot, Hastings Banda, if you don't know who that is, he was the dictatorial leader of uh, Malawi for many, many uh, years. Uh, and at least somewhat incongruously, as I'm sure I'm not the first person to mention, also a biography of Francois Mitterrand. Um, so uh, why he belongs in that list, you'll have to ask um, Mr. Short uh, here in a moment, but uh, uh, an august list of powerful uh, leaders nonetheless. Philip uh, has the credentials, I think, um, uh, to cast such a wide net, writing about uh, authors from uh, so many different parts of the world, because he worked as a foreign correspondent uh, over uh, three uh, or more decades, living uh, for years in Central Africa, Moscow, Beijing, Paris, Tokyo, and most dangerously, Washington, DC. Um, during that time, uh, he wrote for the London Times, uh, The Economist, the BBC, uh, which was his main haunt, and uh, many other uh, outlets. I would be remiss here if I didn't mention one little corner of Philip's uh, biography that's especially important to us uh, here at Dartmouth, and that is that in the fall of 2018 and the winter of 2019, he was a Magro family distinguished fellow in international affairs here at the uh, Dickey Center. Uh, he used that time to work on um, this book, uh, which he's gonna talk about today, so we can feel some pride in helping it uh, come to fruition. But he also taught uh, two courses to our students, 20th Century Russia, Patterns of Government, which he taught in the History Department, and Vladimir Putin, Russia in the 21st century, which he taught in the government department. So he's already been educating Dartmouth students on these subjects even before uh, his book has been in print. So we are very pleased to have uh, Philip back with us. We're looking forward to hearing uh, his insights on Putin, a man who I think quite um, uh, uh, literally has our uh, fate in his hands, his hand on the, on the nuclear button. Uh, after all, and so again, understanding him is among the most important things um, we can do in the world right now. Let me just say, um, before I hand it over to him, if uh, you are uh, interested in reading the book, and I highly recommend uh, that you do, copies are for sale um, outside those doors. Uh, buy our local bookstore, Still North, so you can buy a copy and support a, a local business uh, at the same time. So I urge you to check that out, and then come up uh, after the talk and get your copy signed. So Philip, welcome back to Dartmouth, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much, Ben. Um, you sent me a very tall order explaining what goes on in Putin's mind. I mean, I think most of the CIA and uh, uh, the White House would be very happy if they could do that. Um, and I'm not sure I can, but I can perhaps give you a few kind of inklings um, someone said recently, I think it was Ed Lucas, uh, who 
may, may, may not mean anything much to you. Uh, some of you may recognize it. He was, he's with The Economist, very much a Russia hawk. And he said, you know, what we have to do is look at Putin not as a cardboard cutout, but as a person, as a human being, um, with all the kind of failings and, and successes um, and quirks and foibles and nastiness uh, that human beings have. Mike McFall, who is now at Stanford and who was uh, Obama's ambassador to Moscow, said very much the same thing. And it's quite difficult <laughs> because we're in a, in a time when emotions are white hot for very understandable reasons about the horrors going on in Ukraine. And to say, well, you know, he's not the incarnation of evil. Uh, it doesn't help us to think that way, but we actually need to try and see him as, as another person with all that that entails. Um, a lot of people are rather unhappy about that because they would much rather have a kind of monochrome um, idea, monochrome all black, um, uh, all evil um, uh, portrait of Putin. And we, what we tend to do is we tend to project back. When someone is kind of behaving badly, we like to see that the, you know, the seeds of that bad behavior were earlier in his career. And then we draw a straight line. You know, he started leaning, leaning badly. Um, he got worse, and then he became an absolute monster. And we've drawn a line which we like. But of course, human life is not like that. A lot of people start well and then finish up not quite so well, finish up badly, or the other way around. And if that were not so, we would not have any great novels, we'd not have any great literature, great plays, because it's all about the complexity of human life. So you can't say, well, Putin was rotten to start with and he stayed rotten for the rest of his life and he's rotten now. It's much more complicated than that. He's not paranoid. He's not um, mentally or physically seriously ill. Uh, that's wishful thinking. Bill Burns, uh, the CIA chief, was right when he said he's entirely too healthy um, <laughs> with an air of regret. <laughs> um, he's uh, older. He's just turned 70. Uh, he no longer goes riding bareback on horseback in Siberia. He doesn't do the great, you know, the really tough ski slopes anymore. Um, but he's okay for a guy of his age. And the idea that, you know, he, he, he may die or go fairly soon, I think, is, is really completely wishful thinking. He's with, with us for some time yet. He's rational. I mean, when you think of what he's done in Ukraine, it may not seem that way, but in his own terms, he, he's rational. He operates in a brutal, uh, very cruel environment. Um, He's highly articulate, he's intelligent, he's got a very agile mind. Um, he's a kind of shapeshifter, uh, a little bit of chameleon, that when he, he talks, uh, he tries to convey an image that he knows his interlocutor will uh, react positively to. Um, some people say, well, he learned that in the KGB. Um, I don't think that's true. That was... Putin was Putin before he got into the KGB. The KGB gave him certain sort of tactics, certain techniques, um, not always very sophisticated. When he was in the KGB in the 1970s, uh, when he joined up, um, one of the things you may be surprised to learn, one of the, the books they used for training was Dale Carnegie's How to Make Friends and Influence People, <laughs> because that's actually what operatives try to do. They try to make friends and extract information from them and give away very little about themselves. Um, but Putin was quite good at that before he went through the, the training course. Um, being fascinated by someone, and I confess to being fascinated by Putin, he's uh, secretive and opaque. And to try and get through that kind of hard shell and see what, what exists underneath it, what the reality of the person is that he tries very hard to hide. I found a, a terrific challenge. Um, and uh, it, it, it's what kind of kept me going through the eight years I spent researching this book. If you're going to give your eight years of your life to trying to figure out how someone is, uh, it better be an interesting person. Otherwise, you've really wasted your time. Uh, that said, 
you know, being fascinating is not, does not imply approval. To try to explain is not to justify. And I can't say too often, you know, what, what Putin has done in Ukraine is appalling. His regime is corrupt. Uh, he's ordered critics and opponents murdered. Not as many as you might think. You know, we tend to, to give to the rich. Um, and uh, the, the, the cases where it's absolutely sure that uh, he was directly implicated are not that many. Alexander Litvinenko, who died of polonium poisoning in London, that was certainly with Putin's approval. And the attempt to poison the opposition leader, Alexei Navalny, that also had, had Putin's approval and was ordered by Putin. I have no doubt about that. Um, you can't, I'm, I'm saying, you know, we need to look at him as a rounded figure. You remember John McCain said, uh, oh, he's a, a murderer, a killer, and a thug. And I talked recently to a German professor who said, we shouldn't talk about Russia, they're just a, a band of criminals. It's fine, it, maybe it makes us feel better, but it doesn't actually take us very far in understanding. So that's why I say we've, we've got to try and look beyond that. I would think probably what you're most interested in, because it's what almost everyone is most interested in at the moment, is the war. Why did he do it? What's he trying to achieve? How is it likely to end? How is it likely to end for Ukraine and for Russia and for Putin himself? So uh, let's move on to that. But before I do so, you know, wh what, what formed his character? What eventually, gradually over a period, le led up to this? Um, it's worth talking about because it, it, his attitude to risk. Now, he grew up in a, a very poor, tough area of Leningrad uh, in the 1950s. And uh, pretty primitive conditions in a communal flat, which he shared, they shared with other families. They didn't have a bathroom of their own. They had to go to the public baths. It was dilapidated. It was falling to bits. It was rat infested. The roof leaked, all, all the rest of it. Um, and he spent a lot of his time as a small child, a child hanging out with other young kind of ruffians and terrorways in the apartment courtyard. Um, one of his friends, the guy who he shared a, a desk with at primary school, so we're talking about, you know, when he's nine or ten, remembered him. And he, the boy is called Viktor Borisenko. And he remembered how the way Putin could never resist getting into a fight. And I'll, I'll read you the quote because it, I, I think it's quite revealing. Borisenko said, he didn't seem to have an inner instinct for self-preservation. It never occurred to him that the other boy was stronger and might beat him up. If some hulking guy offended him, he'd jump straight at him, scratch him, bite him, pull out clumps of his hair. He wasn't the strongest in our class, but in a fight he could beat anyone because he'd get into a frenzy and fight to the end. And when we think about Ukraine, I think it's worth remembering that. It's not that he always doubles down. He always fights to the end. There have been times when he's kind of backed off. Um, he prefers to double down if he can. And uh, that, that um, taste for risk, the taking risks, was something which has been very consistent. When he joined the KGB, one of, when he went on a training course, and one of the things that his KGB instructors held against him was that he had a lowered sense of risk. Um, and they didn't like that because they didn't want to recruit operatives who would be reckless. So that stayed with him, but it was sort of compensated by another facet of his character, which is self-control, very, really iron self-control, not showing what he felt, um, and quite consciously later on, because he knew he was aware that he was prone to taking risks um, to force himself not to. It didn't always work. One time when it didn't work, obviously, is, is in Ukraine uh, with the invasion. But there are other times earlier on when you can see that he actually felt something was so important that he had to take a risk, even if he knew it was a gamble. But normally, he tries to curb this inclination to take risks. 
And that's led, in many cases, to him being very cautious, cautious almost to the point of indecision. So you have this contrast between someone who's very kind of incremental and takes a long time to decide, and someone who will, in certain cases, really jump in and, and take a big gamble. Um, Putin, in the KGB, went, as I'm sure most of you know, to East Germany. He was not a great star there. He didn't do very much of, uh, of importance. And um, the irony is that, you know, had the Soviet Union not collapsed, you probably remember he once said that the collapse of the Soviet Union is the greatest geopolitical tragedy of the 20th century. Um, but had that not happened, he would very probably have stayed, spent the rest of his career as a middle-ranking KGB officer in some, some Russian province. It was the collapse of the Soviet Union which opened the way for him to go where he's gone, uh, to get into politics, and to rise vertiginously uh, th through the administration. Because um, the collapse of the Soviet Union meant that politics suddenly became interesting in Russia, suddenly flourished. And there were all kinds of opportunities which didn't exist before. And he linked up, at the behest of the KGB, it has to be said, with one of the new liberal leaders, a guy called Anatoly Sobchak, who became mayor of St. Petersburg. And the KGB had basically instructed him to become a kind of minder for Sobchak. And um, he did. Uh, he became Sobchak's assistant. Then uh, his loyalties began to shift. He never formally left the KGB, and he invented all kinds of stories to try and explain why he, he wasn't with them anymore and why he'd, he was now with Sobchak. None of those stories were true. <laughs> In fact, <laughs> he'd been posted to Sobchak, and then he decided that his future lay more with, with a political role, more with uh, being a... Uh, uh, part of the St. Petersburg administration than being with the KGB, which was kind of his, the future of the KGB at that time was not very clear, you know? So uh, he rose very quickly. Two years later, he became deputy mayor, acting mayor of Russia's second city, five million people. You know, in two or three years, that's a pretty dizzying uh, success, dizzying rise. And then uh, to Moscow, where, again, he rose very quickly through the presidential administration. People uh, often say Putin became an accidental president. I don't think, I don't buy that. I don't think that's true. Um, he all had a knack of being in the right place at the right time and of making himself indispensable. And he also had, although he hid it very carefully, he deep down he had ambition for himself. So uh, he moved up, he became um, a senior member of the presidential administration, then head of the FSB, which was the KGB's successor, national security advisor, prime minister, and then eventually acting president. Um, he was quite ruthless about removing people who got in his way, um, which is another indication that Actually, he did have ambition, even if he, he held it. He, he kept it kept it kind of down and kept it in secret. And ooh, this is my thing has come off my belt. I'll put it in my pocket. Sorry, this is this enables me to speak through the microphone. This little box transmits it, but it fell off. Um, as president, uh, we tend to forget, you know, Putin. The first years of his presidency was very genuinely pro-Western. We don't think about that very much now, but George W. Bush in his memoirs um, remembered the help that Russia gave uh, after 9-11. You know, overflight rights. Um, uh, Putin was the first person to call uh, after 9-11. Um, they, they gave a lot of help also with establishing bases for American forces in Central Asia, um, <coughs> transit rights, all this stuff. And Bush wrote in his memoirs that he was astonished uh, how much help no one had in the White House had expected the Russians to come forward uh, with the degree of help they offered. 
And indeed, Putin himself um, was criticized in Russia, inside Russia, for going out on a limb. People said, you're going out on a limb to help those Americans, and you're getting nothing back. And that was public criticism. And he, he said publicly, um, no, rapprochement with the West is not Putin's policy. It's Russia's policy. Um, there are people who say, oh, that was all just a facade. He was just, you know, playing with words. But it wasn't playing with words. They were real actions that, uh, you know, can't be, can't be faked. If you actually help somebody, uh, there's real help there. So it started rather well. But then, and it started well with Europe as well. Um, people like uh, Tony Blair in Britain, um, Chirac in France, the, the relationship was good. It was very positive. And Putin kept on saying that um, you know, Russia's place is, is with Europe. Russia belongs, it's part of Europe. And we are part of the civilized world, by which he meant you know, the international community uh, with everybody else. But it didn't work out that way, as we all know. It, it went very, very sour. And the question is why? I think to try and understand why, we have to go back to the 1990s, after, just after the collapse of, of the Soviet Union, when um, Russians were really euphoric, many Russians anyway, intellectuals, people who um, <laughs> looked to the West uh, as a kind of beacon. Uh, the, the, the line was, you know, we're going to be just like Westerners. We're going to have the same prosperity. We're going to have the same freedoms as they have over there. And of course, it didn't happen. And when democracy brought chaos to Russia, because it did in the 1990s, they were disabused and felt cheated. Uh, there's an qu interesting quote from uh, Putin's mentor. I mentioned Anatoly Sobchak, who was the great liberal leader of uh, St. Petersburg. And he said, America spent billions in the struggle against communism but now they can't find any money to support a democracy that's overthrown communism. It's very bitter, um, but there is some truth in that because the West was pretty niggardly with aid to Russia back in the 90s um, for reasons that are understandable. People said, well, you know, their institutions are such a mess. If we give money, we'll just be pouring it down a black hole. And there was, there was some justice in that argument. Nonetheless, uh, the Russians felt cheated. They felt bitter, rightly or wrongly. Then, 1993, we come to another <coughs> very controversial business. Uh, Clinton announced NATO expansion, NATO enlargement. And I know that in uh, the US, the foreign policy uh, uh, establishment, the conventional view, the received wisdom is there were never any promises made to Russia that NATO would not expand. Um, well, I'm going to be uncharacteristically blunt and say simply that is not true. Um, it's, a, it's a line that is spun, uh, but it's not based on fact. Um, not just, you know, the, the, the people say James Baker uh, promised Gorbachev that uh, NATO wouldn't move one inch to the east. <coughs> Baker walked that back pretty quickly afterwards because he'd gone beyond what he was supposed to say. But what is really, I, I think, proves it and, and is very difficult to disprove, <coughs> lots of other European leaders, a whole galaxy of them, made exactly the same pledge to uh, the Russians, to Yeltsin and uh, other, other Russian officials. Uh, James... Uh, um, John Major, the British Prime Minister, did. Uh, Douglas Hurd, British Foreign Secretary. Manfred Werner, the uh, German Secretary General of NATO. They all, and other European leaders too, they all promised <coughs> Russians, their Russian interlocutors, there will be no enlargement of, of NATO towards the Russian border. And I've spoken to Western ambassadors who were present at those meetings and have <laughs> written uh, verbatims for, for, for the, <laughs> their foreign offices, <coughs> forgive me, uh, and say, you know, there is no question. That is not something that can be denied. 
rightly or wrongly, promises were given. So again, when NATO did expand, the Russians thought, <coughs> we're being cheated. Now, um, that's not to say it was wrong to expand NATO. It's just to say they did feel cheated again. <coughs> There's one, one other argument. Oh, yes, uh, b before I come to that. Um, it's not just NATO that was the problem. It's <coughs> the Bush administration did a whole load of things which the Russians didn't like. They abandoned the anti-ballistic missile treaty, which the Russians thought was kind of the basis of, um, <coughs> forgive me, uh, the basis of uh, the edifice of uh, nuclear disarmament. Um, uh, they uh, set up, a, a, the Americans set up a nuclear defense, uh, sorry, not, a missile defense shield in Eastern Europe. Um, Iraq, uh, Russia, very much opposed the Iraq war, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> there were a whole load of things. And on the Russian side, they did a whole load of things too. I mean, don't think I'm just saying, oh, you know, the US did this, that, and the other. The Russians did this, that, and the other too. They, <clears throat> there were a lot of backsliding. Sorry, I'm going to have to have a drink of water. <clears throat> there was a lot of backsliding on economic freedoms, um, human rights restrictions on the media, um, not to mention the, the, we talked earlier about, you know, murders of political opponents. So <coughs> both sides did things which the others didn't like. But I, I, I always think, you know, um, when, when we're looking at this, uh, who won the Cold War? We did, the West did. <coughs> Victor, the, the winners in a war normally fix the agenda for what follows. Now, if we fix the agenda for what followed the end of the Cold War, <coughs> and it's led to the situation we have at the moment, perhaps we didn't do everything exactly right. Um, the Russians didn't do everything right either. And there's a very strong argument that things would have gone, turned really bad whatever America had done, whatever the West had done, whatever Russia would have done. Um, Bill Burns, <coughs> when he was, he wrote his memoirs after being ambassador um, in, in Moscow. He was there in 2006, 7, 8. <coughs> in his memoirs, he said that the relationship, whatever anyone would have done, it was almost bound to end in a train wreck. And his argument was that both sides had fatal illusions. The Russians thought that America would accept them as an equal, and America thought that Russia would just meekly follow the American lead. And neither was ever going to happen. You know, uh, uh, Russia uh, refused to be led, and America insisted on leading. It's a kind of recipe for disaster. <coughs> and it, <coughs> it was bound to lead to a conflict but it didn't have to lead to the kind of conflict we have now. It didn't have to lead to war. And the fact that it has, um, I think you can attribute very directly to Putin. This is <coughs> Putin's war rather than um, Russia's war. Without Putin, it might well not have happened, um, <coughs> or at least not happened in the same way. Why did it happen? I think the, the war can be seen in various ways. Um, you know, the, it, it, it can be seen as a kind of, you know, a, a consequence or a, a stage in the slow motion collapse of the Soviet Union. And there's a parallel here with Yugoslavia. Remember the Balkan Wars? Yugoslavia broke up. <laughs> its constituent parts, uh, Serbia, uh, made war against Croatia and Bosnia. Um, with Russia, it's happened much more, Soviet Union, it's happened in much more slow motion, but you have a very similar, but much more wor worrying, a much bigger scale uh, disaster <coughs> with Russia attacking a former, another constituent part of the Soviet Union, Ukraine. <coughs> you can see it as a kind of power play, um, a post-imperial power play, <coughs> 
of uh, Russia trying to preserve its imperial role after the collapse of the empire, the Soviet Union. Why now? I think partly opportunism. Remember, the West reacted pretty quietly, pretty mildly to um, the annexation of, of Crimea, to Russia's, um, I won't say Russia's war against Georgia, because it actually started as Georgia attacking Russian troops in South Ossetia. We, again, tend to forget that. But the Georgian war, uh, Russia uh, suffered very little from. Um, so, you know, Putin thought he would probably get away with it. The Biden administration um, in the middle of 2021, the withdrawal from Afghanistan, didn't, didn't look to Russia, didn't look to Moscow as though they had a very strong and determined adversary in Washington. Um, <clears throat> and there are another set of reasons which I'm venturing again onto more controversial territory. Um, <clears throat> Putin, since 2018, when he um, was elected for his uh, fourth term, has been toying with the idea of a political succession, a political transition. And um, when he saw that I mean, political transition, it's difficult to know how serious he was, but it's certainly something he was thinking about. You know, would Putin ever actually risk take the, the, the risk, taking the plunge and leaving the presidency and putting somebody else in as his successor. Um, he would think about it, sure, and he was thinking about it, but would he actually do so? <laughs> I don't know. Um, but what we can say is that it was in his mind. And when um, the Afghan stuff happened and um, the Biden administration didn't seem particularly stable, particularly um, well well well-rooted in Washington um, and looked weak. He considered that there might be a last opportunity to try and bring Ukraine to heel. Um, Putin had always had a kind of a fixation about Ukraine, going right back to the 1990s. <coughs> you know, why did the Soviet Union break up? Well, because of the Ukrainian decision to, to declare independence. Uh, the Ukrainians, he thought, were ingrates. Um, they, they lived off uh, Russian oil and, uh, and gas subsidies. Um, he, you're back, you're going back again to the 1990s, and you find Putin complaining about Crimea should not belong to uh, Ukraine. You know, Russian won it in the 19th century from the Turks. So this has been a kind of neuralgic issue for him for a very long time. And... Um, <coughs> To try and, and, and bring back uh, Ukraine to the Russian fold, as he thought, would be the crowning achievement of his career if he could bring it off. And if he could bring it off, and if he could do that, he would be in a much stronger position when I finish. I promise, when I, when I get to the end, I'm very happy to <laughs> hear the question. Um, uh, if he could bring that off, um, it would uh, put him in a much stronger position to, uh, to, to effect that kind of political transition, perhaps to, to choose a protege to, to take over the presidency while he withdrew to a still powerful but, but uh, no longer the same position. So that was the thinking. Um, this was a window of opportunity, given his you know, really long obsession with Ukraine, to do something about it, and that would be his legacy. <coughs> now, it didn't work. I mean, why didn't it work? Uh, I'm sure you've read a lot of things. I think there are two absolutely key reasons. Um, one is that the United States um, gave both immediately before the invasion and uh, in the days, first days of the invasion, a considerable amount of covered help on the ground in Kiev. Um, help in the form of intelligence sharing, help in the, in, in the form of direction and advice. I think the re one of the reasons that the Russians were not able to get uh, control of Hostomel, the, the airport, uh, 
from which, which they wanted to use as a bridgehead to take Kiev was because of that um, intelligence sharing by the Americans, um, which was extremely effective. The other thing that he got completely wrong <coughs> was the strength, the capacity, capabilities of the Russian army. What was supposed to be a blitzkrieg, matter of days or at most a couple of weeks, that um, uh, he, uh, they would secure Kiev, they would decapitate the uh, Ukrainian government, and then it would basically be all over by the shouting. They'd put in a puppet regime. It didn't happen. And once it didn't happen, the West really stepped up the aid with, um, once they could see the Ukrainians were resisting, that Zelensky had stayed, um, and was providing in inspirational leadership. I mean, no question that he did, uh, and he still is. Um, then the, the unprecedented sanctions kicked in, um, and the, the arms supplies to the Ukrainians, and financial help to Ukraine. Because it's not just arms supplies. Um, you know, Ukraine has to pay uh, all the government employees to keep the hospitals running, to keep the railways running. Um, the, there is a, a huge amount of money that is needed every month. And some of that, a key part of that, is coming from the West, coming from America, little bits from Europe, who are very much dragging their feet over this. And the rest is coming from the printing press. There's 30% inflation in, in Ukraine. And if it goes up any further, they will be risking hyperinflation, which would be another kind of, um, would, would effectively make it impossible to sustain the war effort. So money is just as important as, as, uh, as arms. Um, just worth saying in passing, you know, we, I said earlier, right at the beginning, Putin actually is quite rational um, in his own terms. Uh, if, just suppose that they had, the Russians had taken Hostomel, that they had secured Kiev, that they had decapitated as they planned, the Ukrainian government, we will be in a whole completely different ball game. Giving, because with a, a puppet government in place, uh, it would no longer be possible for the West to supply the regular Ukrainian army. I think sanctions would probably be much less. So it, for, in other words, from Putin's point of view, believing that he could succeed in this blitz, blitzkrieg, um, it wasn't quite as irrational as we, we make it sound. Sure, he got it completely wrong, and it, <laughs> it turned out to be completely irrational, but it was possible to think that it could work better. It was possible for him to think that for in his terms. Now, um, another, again, brief thought in passing, that I think we have to be very, very careful about um, the, the, the way that what we believe of what we read <laughs> in, in the media and from academics and from politicians and be very careful of what you believe about what I may say because uh, I think every, every, everything about this war, uh, there is this huge tendency for all sides to spin as much as they can. And that's absolutely normal. Information war is now part, a very important part of war and uh, when it comes to casualty figures which are bandied about, I, I find them very often not believable, um, not plausible. Um, uh, we, you, you, you have to ask yourselves, the fall of Kirsten, for example, you know, there have been headlines saying, yes, the Ukrainians have taken Kirsten, it's, it, Kirsten. it's the beginning of the end, Putin's, you know, Putin's forces are retiring, uh, the, the Ukrainians are winning. Um, no, it was important. Uh, the British Defense Secretary, um, Ben Wallace, said just, I think, yesterday, the Ukrainians have the momentum, but it's not great momentum yet. The Russians are not giving up. So this is something, I think, which is going to play out over some considerable time. And Putin certainly is playing a very long game it's, it's not something where you can say, oh, this is the great turning point. Another um, thing we hear about Putin pretty often, um, 
is, okay, there may be a palace coup. Uh, again, be very wary of that. <laughs> Putin has arranged his system in such a way that the different factions are carefully balanced, um, uh, that they don't trust each other, that it's almost impossible for them to coordinate among themselves. Um, I'm not saying that it's totally excluded that they could, if things go really, really bad, that there could be a movement against Putin, but we're nowhere near that yet. It's not even visible across the horizon. Um, so that's, that's another thing which needs to be treated with great caution. But Ukraine, I've talked about Ukraine as a Putin fixation. It was not the only, or even I would argue, the most important thing he wanted to do. The most important thing he wanted to do was to show that the West and America in particular was powerless to prevent him taking over Ukraine. Because Putin believes that uh, America is in at least relative decline. And the figures can be adduced to support that. You know, American GDP was. 40% uh, of world GDP back in 1960, 24% today. Doesn't mean America's got weaker, but it means other countries have got stronger. So he believes, and um, much of the global South also believes, that the time has come to move away from what we call the US-led rules-based order to a much more multipolar system. And in the particular case of Russia, the Russians are kind of leading the pack. Um, the rest of the world, you can say, well, they're, they're like the jackals who are looking around and hoping that the Russians succeed or be interested if the Russians succeed in knocking off the top dog, America, from its pedestal. Um, now, you may say that's all very far-fetched, but uh, there is a substantial part of, of the global community of the world that would actually quite like that to happen. If you look at the 10 most populous countries in the world, how many are supporting sanctions? One, the US. China, India, Nigeria, Indonesia, Mexico, the others aren't. Turkey isn't. Saudi Arabia isn't. Uh, they're all kind of sitting on the fence waiting to see how it plays out. Even Israel, surprise, surprise, is not supporting America as strongly as America would like in this. So it's very much the West. It's not the world against Russia. It's very much the West and certain of its allies. Um, and for, this is why it, it's the, the, the war in Ukraine is so important. It's, uh, if you like, a symbol. It's like a a catalyst of a much broader geopolitical transition uh, from a world in which America leads to a world in which uh, the Russians, the Chinese, and others would like to see a group of countries, a concert of nations. We haven't been there since the 19th century. Con a concert of nations, a multipolar system, come into being. So how? How is it going to end? Um, I think one of the things one can say is that um, you know, the stakes are so high for both sides that it's very, very difficult because for, for, it's important for America. If America were not to be seen to succeed, then its credibility as a protector of its allies and its partners would be greatly diminished. For Putin, um, he's kind of bet the farm on this. <laughs> I'm not saying Russia's going to collapse. If, if, I'm not saying he's, he's going to be out if, it, if it, it doesn't work, but he's really gambled a, a, a big time on it. So how could it end? I think it's possible to, to see um, the outline of a, of a solution. Um, and I'm not saying this is going to happen, but it's the most plausible explanation that one can offer, um, that uh, the Russians are able to keep the Donbass, the land bridge to Crimea, and Crimea. And Putin can then say that 
he has essentially done what he wished to do. Um, America could say, well, we have actually done what we needed. We weren't able to prevent the Russians attacking, but we were able to prevent them uh, dominating uh, Ukraine and prevent them uh, uh, negating Ukrainian sovereignty and independence. The problem, of course, is the Ukrainians are not going to be not going to want to buy that at all. Um, it's very difficult to see either side ever being able to achieve a decisive victory. I, I think the idea that the Ukrainians could kick the Russians out completely is a little far-fetched. And from what we're seeing at the moment, there's no chance at all of, of the Russians being able to dominate Ukraine completely. So the solution has to be somewhere in the middle. But exactly where? Very, very hard to say. Very hard to say what the Ukrainians might accept. I think you, you know, the, the Biden White House says all the time it's for the Ukrainians to decide. But I think in the end, the, the hard reality is that it's going to be America and Russia that decide the, the final contours. And Amer Ukraine will, will then have, as smaller countries usually do, have to do what the greater powers decide, kicking and screaming and objecting, I'm sure. Um, but it's a sad story, and it's not going to end well for anybody. It's not going to, really not going to end as anyone would have wished. Um, I think that's another of the kind of givens about this. But the reality is that Ukraine is there. It's not going to move. It's not going to go away. Russia is there. It's not going to move away. And as, as President Macron said, you know, geography is, is stubborn. Eventually, they will have to find a way to live with each other because that's how all wars end. The question, as always, is how they're going to get there. And that's as far as I can take it. That's a question I can't answer. <laughs> we can all speculate about it. Um, now, I'm, I'm over to you. Who, this, you were going to put your hand up, so please. Question, yes. Thank you. I know you said that Putin does not have a paranoid personality. So how would you explain that what he said was going on? Does he really believe that what he's been telling Russians is going on in Ukraine? And that's why we got to go in there and save them because of the awful stuff that Ukrainians are doing. It's a fair, very fair question. I'm glad you asked it. No, he doesn't believe it at all. He doesn't believe it. No, he's been talking. He's been, no, but for a reason. Um, Putin has been talking about the Nazis. Uh, you know, this is a Nazi government in, in U Ukraine. And they're carrying out genocide against the Russian-speaking population. None of that is true. It is to re resonate with uh, especially the older Russian population. But those who remember, to, to make the link with the Second World War when... Russia was fighting the Nazis. And genocide, it's, you know, it's, it's a word which is thrown around, it kind of in, inspires, not inspires people, but it, it, it resonates with people. Um, the Ukrainians have accused the Russians of committing genocide in Ukraine. The Russians have accused the Ukrainians of committing genocide in, in, in the Donbass. Going back to Yugoslavia, Milosevic accused uh, the Bosnians and Croats are committing genocide against, uh, against the uh, Serbian di diaspora, and so on and so forth. These are kind of words that you use to light, light flames of indignation, and that's why, why Putin did it. But he knows perfectly well that these are not Nazis. It's, it's a spin. It's a line. Uh, he does have in his head the idea that the, the West wants to bring uh, you, uh, Russia down, that the, the West wants to encircle Russia and uh, bring it to its knees and, and force it uh, to, to do as the West wishes. Yes. So in that sense, uh, this you can say, well, you can say that's paranoid, but Russians through the centuries <laughs> have worried about the West you know, encroaching on their Western, uh, their Western borders. Anyway, young lady. Yeah. 
Um, hello. Thank you so much for your, your talk and for your book. Um, I'm Russian citizen. Um, I'm not Russian uh, as a ethnicity. So, and I have a question about what you wrote in the end that Russia has to be behaving well as our European countries because Russia is a part of European family. And I'm from Siberia. Yeah. And eh, I don't think that you're right that uh, Russia is European country. I don't... I don't think that uh, that this uh, Moscow-centric uh, view on Russia should be, you, you know, like carrying uh, with uh, uh, Cold War and other things. And maybe this is a problem between Russia and West because you see Russia as a Kremlin, you know, so and that is not what Russia is. Uh, inside. Well, I think we, we are we talking about Ruski or about Russianin? In other words, Russians. Uh, there are the two words for Russian in in Russian. One, one is um, like Russian citizenship, and one is Russian ethnicity, and they're both Russian. Yes, um, it's not me who's saying that Russia ought to be part of, of, of Europe. It's Putin who's saying that Russia is European. And those who are ethnically Russian certainly um, believe that. Not all of them. There are, there are people like you know, the Eurasian philosophers, uh, polit politicals, who, who say, well, Russia is um, a Eurasian country. It's part European and part Asian. And it's a very difficult issue. But my point was that Putin... Um, initially wanted, said very strongly and said very often, Russia is part of Europe, Russian culture is European. And that is stronger, surely, that Russian culture, you think of Tolstoy and Dostoevsky and uh, all the Russian uh, composers, um, they are part of, of, of what is regarded, what Europeans regarded as their, their cultural heritage. Now, it's quite true that Russians under Peter the Great spread into Siberia and uh, colonized. No? So, um, is the Russian... Is it, is it fair to say that um, the Russians who had Russian culture, in other words, European culture, have colonized Siberia? Uh, uh, for me, the question is how West look at Russia, not at Putin, uh, because Putin, of course, uh, is from Leningrad, St. Petersburg, and uh, that's a European part of Russia. But the Western view of Russia, right, as a Moscow, as a uh, Europeans who colonized Russia, right, doesn't mean that Russia is represented by those Europeans, right? So, and I think that if we can change our approach to look at Russia not as a European country, but a country which is like what it is, <laughs> uh, of course, uh, very complicated and diverse. Is, is Eurasian. It's, yeah, it's, is yes. Eurasian, and then we can understand it better, I guess, and uh, well, maybe uh, deal better not with Kremlin and not with, again, uh, colonizers, right? Because Russia is bigger than that. But there's been a debate that is going back hundreds of years in Russia, is it not? between the westernizers who say we belong with Europe and the Eurasianists who say, no, um, uh, we, we are not European. Um, uh, Putin now has, of course, turned much more towards Asia because he's burnt his boats with, uh, with, with Europe. Um, so that now what you're saying would be much more um, in favor in Moscow. <laughs> than it was. But 20 years ago, it was the other way around. Um, I, I agree with you. It's a very difficult issue, which has divided Russians, um, the, 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 you know, the Slavophiles, 
and the Westernizers in the 19th century. And it goes back before that, um, this, this uncertainty about what Russia's identity properly is. You, you remember the, the, the double-headed eagle, which faces west and faces east. Um, well, that's the Russian emblem. Which way do you face? Or do you face both ways? Or are you really fundamentally uh, European? I don't think we'll, you and I will solve this problem today. <laughs> Sir. Uh, you uh, chosen to depict uh, Putin as a gambler, and he's bet the house. Mm -hmm. But you've chosen also, it seems, to not include his biggest gamble, which is the nuclear option. And I'd be interested to know why you decided not to uh, venture into that complicated territory. And, the, and then the second question is, in psychohistory, the phenomena that happen historically are dependent upon the player. What if Putin, uh, what if Putin were removed uh, using the same methodology that he's removed other people who don't agree with him? In other words, if he were yeah. assassinated. Yeah, let, let, let's take the nuclear thing. Um, my... My judgment about this, and, and uh, it can only be a judgment because none of us knows what is actually going on inside Putin's head, is that it is not completely excluded that he could use tactical nuclear weapons. Um, but it would be absolutely a last resort. Uh, Russian military doctrine, doctrine does permit the use of, of nuclear weapons when there is an existential threat um, to the country or to the regime. Uh, I think in practice it, one should interpret it that way. But there are loads of other things he could do first, and we're seeing one of them right now, destroying e Ukrainian infrastructure, which is not just uh, like the Blitz of London to intimidate the Ukrainian people. It's to destroy the Ukrainian economy. Uh, because no economy, it makes it much more difficult to carry on the war. Um, cyber attacks, we haven't seen a huge amount of that yet. Um, there are... There have been suggestions very recently that um, uh, methods could be used to, to wipe out the Ukrainian communication system. Um, that would be a significant escalation. Um, so all these things are possible along the road, but using tactical nuclear weapons, I'm not sure he'd want to go there. Um, as I say, not ruling it out. But I think it would be really an act of some desperation. And if he did it, I suspect it would not just be one. It would be a sufficient number, so 20 or 30 tactical warheads let off, to actually have an effect on the battlefield. Um, and that would be a very serious escalation. The other thing about it is how would the United States respond? There aren't that many good options. I mean, I know Jake Sullivan has been over and has been uh, saying to them that there'd be very serious consequences and so on. But what do you do short of a nuclear repast? Sanctions, forget it. They're not working anyway properly. <coughs> it's something we haven't really discussed, but <coughs> I'll talk for a moment in a second about that. But um, I, I, I think it's very difficult to see an adequate response if Putin were to use nuclear weapons. So that's another problem there. But as I say, highly unlikely. Somebody mentioned, I mentioned sanctions, <laughs> not somebody, me. Um, <laughs> let, let me um, just say, I, you know, we, we all have been talking about unprecedented sanctions against Russia. Well, um, the Russian economy is going to shrink three or four percent this year, not 15 percent, as people were saying at the beginning. Um, the ruble is stable. Uh, uh, the budget deficit looks like being 2 percent. A lot of European countries would be very happy to have a 2 percent budget deficit. <laughs> they've earned more this year because of high prices from oil and gas than they've uh, uh, earned last year, and so on. I have a friend who came back very recently from Moscow. Um, and who divides her time between the small village in southern France where I live and Moscow. She runs a little travel agency. And she said, life in Moscow and St. Petersburg is, is really pretty normal. 
um, there was a, a flutter of, of a flurry of, of unhappiness and, and worry when uh, the partial mobilization was going on and people worried about their sons and their relatives being called up. But since then, um, the cafes are full, the restaurants are full, there are art exhibitions in the galleries, the museums, people go to the theater. Life is pretty normal. And interestingly, she said she, she's arranging holidays for, for Russians in Turkey and Dubai and Maldives, um, that she's doing more business than before. And uh, it's a small, she's got about three or four people in, in Moscow working with her. Um, but there are workarounds, you know, through bank accounts in Uzbekistan. And she did say that she's doing business with one major American hotel chain still. I won't say which one. <laughs> but there are workarounds. You know, people are getting on. So sanctions have just not worked. And they haven't worked because fundamentally, I mean, they may work over time. A Russian economist say, you know, the blows are now, the bruises will appear later. That may well be the case. But for the moment, because so many countries are prepared, you know, not to support sanctions or to, to, to find ways around them, they are really not being as effective as people thought. And even if they do start to work, the calculation is Russia could go back to the situation it was in economically in, say, 2005, 2008. Well, Russians can live with that. You know, it's still better than when Putin came to power. Um, so, I, I mean, you know, it's, it's not, not open and shut case by any manner of means. You, young man. Yes, so um, I was, oh, thank you. I was, I, I was wondering uh, during your uh, years of research into uh, Putin, if you were able to elucidate to what effect uh, the philosophies of Ivan Ilyin or Alexander Dugan have had in his thought. Yeah, the, uh, Putin has has this question about you know how how much Putin's really intellectually interested in these early 20th century, late 19th century philosophers. Ivan Ilyin is one. Um, Soloviev is an, another. There are three or four, um, uh, and the uh, Russian historian Kluchevsky. Um, and now Alexander Dugin uh, is said to have some, his ideas are said to have some influence on Putin. I think one has to take all that with a, a grain of salt. Um, <laughs> Putin was introduced in about 2004, um, about 18 years ago, to these books by a film director called Nikita Mikhalkov. And um, he did, he certainly took an interest. Ilyin, um, th these are fundamentally nas Russian nationalists. And there's another one that you didn't mention, Lev Gumilov, uh, who's, a, again, a Russian nationalist, a Eurasianist. Um, they have influenced Putin in his, his thought about Russia having a special path, about Russia having <coughs> being a, a, a nation with its own specific destiny and all this kind of stuff. But politically, um, I, I think Putin takes his own decisions. To, he's not influenced by uh, right-wing um, hawks like Alexander Dugin. The idea that Dugin is... Um, uh, in, in some way, you know, Putin's the master thinker behind Putin. That's complete rubbish. Um, he has to take into account the, 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 the right-wing people, the right-wing nationalists around him who are pushing him to, to uh, say, why, you know, why aren't you doing more to advance the war? He has to take that into account because these are, in some cases, quite scary, nasty people who have a certain amount of power. Um, but uh, it, no, he takes his own decisions. I, th I think one should not exaggerate the, the influence that anyone has on him. Um, again, going back to his childhood, one of his, one of his friends, no, his, his judo coach, let me get this right, his judo coach said, the, the, the only person who can actually influence Putin and make him do something is Putin himself. And I think that's remained true for mo most of his life. He's his own man. 
this. Thank you for a fascinating lecture. Um, although you said that um, Putin is in good health, uh, the, mm -hmm. the, we, we all, there is a book on everyone, and it, the last chapter eventually comes to us all. Um, what do you think will happen when Putin does eventually leave his post, whether due to you know, death or he yeah. voluntarily retreats? What will happen then with the power vacuum that that might create in Russia? I'm just curious on your thoughts on that. I think there are two, po two possibilities. Um, one, uh, and you say, you know, when he leaves his post. We talked earlier about a political, starting a political transition. Um, I, my, my judgment on, on this is that Putin does not want to die in office, okay? Um, Yeltsin stepped down. There was a peaceful transition. Putin took over. If he can't do as well, that would be kind of a humiliation, a defeat, um, that he wasn't able to accomplish something which his predecessor were able, was able to do. So ideally, yes, he would like a, a transition. And if he can do it himself, in other words, if he can um, uh, choose the modalities whereby somebody takes over from him, uh, yeah, I think there could be a, a pretty stable transition. If he can't, if for any reason he, he does die in office or uh, <laughs> for some reason we can't see he's removed and is unable to, to make that happen, it could be very nasty um, because you do have all these, these clans and as I say, the, in the security services and they are, find it very difficult to coordinate among themselves or to come to any kind of agreement. There could be quite a, a nasty struggle um, over a period of time. And, you know, the Soviet system has been, when it was Soviet, it was a different system then, but it's been through that. After Stalin's death, there was uh, a couple of, a few years anyway, where things were being fought out under the carpet. Um, and you saw the bones fly out, and eventually you knew who'd won. So. Please. Thank you. I'm a visiting scholar from Ukraine, from Kyiv. Yes. And I teach here uh, courses which are quite close to the topic that you study. I teach in particular issues in the history of translation and censorship uh, in Ukraine uh, and uh, language ideologies in literary and uh, media translation. Uh, and I am um, interested... Uh, in uh, my routine work uh, with uh, uh, Putin's narratives. In particular, uh, I appreciate you mentioning uh, rationality of Putin. It was actually Joe Biden who uh, called Putin a rational player. Uh, what, what is alarming for me as a scholar from Ukraine is irrationality of the modern Russian society in general. So those are cultural issues. For instance, a very popular Russian writer and literary scholar, Dmitry Bukov, who actually is considered the best, one of the best scholars in literature in contemporary Russia, uh, in his latest interview given to the News Factory program dated November 5 of this year, uh, he literally spoke about the demons that invaded the souls of Russians. He said in particular that today's Russia is possessed by demons because there are too many voids in it. And the demons like to settle in the voids to occupy them, completely filling the waste ground with themselves. And the demons seem to be launching suicidal programs in the souls of Russians. Seek. And uh, uh, actually, Bukov argues that the project of a new society of Soviet Russia, which the Russians have been proud of, was destroyed with the collapse of the Soviet Union. You mentioned this ambition. And everything positive became a wasteland in Russia. And the demons are frolicking in this wasteland. Russia's war on Ukraine broke out because of jealousy. This is a jealousy murder, summarizes Bukov. He uh, says it's jealousy. What's, what's the question? 
Yes, yes. My question: uh, What what is about uh, the uh, well uh, the society or the Russian people that produces Putin? Putin is a collective product. Putin relies on the people's beliefs, uh, prejudices, on people's irrational, right, right. the grassroots so, so, irrationality. So this the, is my question. The question is what Please produces take it into Putin. Account. Yes, Thank what's you. wrong with Russian society that they should produce Putin? I think you can ask that kind of question about a lot of societies. And <laughs> okay, I won't say any more. I think you've got the message. I mean, I'm thinking of Britain as well as um, other countries which speak the same language. Um, no, uh, Putin is, I, I agree with you, he's an authentic Russian. Um, he uh, reflects um, and is able to, to mobilize Russian aspirations, Russian hopes, um, as well as producing a lot of opposition. Uh, you know, don't underestimate the number of Russians who say about Ukraine, um, I hate what Putin is doing. I hate Putin. I, I really don't like this, this government, this system. But Russia is my country, and Russia is fighting a war, so I'm going to support Russia. <laughs> you know, it's my country right or wrong, right or wrong. Um, there, is, there is that. But um, I don't think there's anything wrong with the Russian people. It's just you, you, Putin is... is um, uh, an emanation of uh, Russian culture, Russian history, um, the way Russians feel. And that, that's why he's so popular. You remember Izvestia said once, I think it was Izvestia, right at the beginning of his, his, um, his, his time in power, um, he's very popular because people feel, oh, he's just like me. And it's very difficult to hate someone who you think is just like yourself. So, you know, there is that that element of reflecting uh, a, a much wider um, ru Russian being, which people can relate to. I can't take it any further than that, because you're going to say, well, what makes Russians like they are? And we could be here till tomorrow morning and still arguing about that. <laughs> OK, so. Can you talk a little bit about what, how he came about? You're talking about you know, his time with Yeltsin and what Russia was like as he came to power. Wasn't there a campaign of misinformation? There were some bombings happening at the time of some apartment buildings. There was a general feeling of insecurity, right. which seems to have been manufactured. Can you, can you comment about that? What, the, 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 the apartment bombing campaign? For example, and the corruption that was happening with the Austin. And it, well, it seems like there was a stew there at the time. I think, I think that's one of the most interesting things. Actually, it's where I start my book, because a lot of people believe, um, not, not just in the West, but in Russia, Many Russians believe, I mean, Russians are like Americans in that respect. They tend to think the worst of their government, okay? Uh, if things go wrong, it's, the government is, is certainly behind the scenes. The government is, is doing, <laughs> is, is making it all happen. Um, but uh, in, in September of 1999, when Putin was prime minister, um, there were explosions which killed a lot of people in apartment buildings in Moscow and in other cities. And it was said, um, initially for political reasons, but then kind of the story took wing, uh, that uh, the FSB, the intelligence, and Putin's people and Yeltsin's people were responsible for these bombings because they wanted to create a, clear, a climate of fear and panic which would make them turn to a strong leader in the shape of Putin. That basically was the story. And there were some very strange things that happened, um, uh, particularly one uh, uh, in Ryazan, a town in, in uh, southwest of Moscow. Um, uh, some FSB people were surprised actually um, laying what appeared to be explosives. The trouble with all this is that once you really looked at it carefully and you took a, each incident to pieces, it didn't stand up. It didn't make sense. It was not believable that it was the, the Russians, who, the, the Russian intelligence, the Russian authorities that were doing this. Um, it was almost certainly not even the Chechens. It was, it was a Dagestani groups with Chechen support who were doing it because the war was going on in Chechnya at that time. 
But the story has become so rooted in, in Western belief and in, you know, many, many very intelligent, very thoughtful Russians believe it too. Um, it's very difficult to dislodge that story. And you can say, well, <laughs> the head of the CIA in Moscow at that time, a guy called Mark Kelton, he was the station chief. He is adamant that it didn't happen, you know. Um, he, it was the Chechens who did it. He never saw anything to suggest. I talked to the head of, the, uh, of MI6 at the time and his successor. They both were completely convinced it was the Chechens who did it. So the intelligence specialists said, no, this is another of these kind of conspiracy theories that's taken on a life of its own. But it's, um, it's almost impossible to get... People are so convinced of it, they won't believe it. <laughs> it's a real problem. Okay, sir, you've been waiting. Oh, thank, you. thank you. May I ask two questions? One, somewhat lighter, uh, but perhaps not. Uh, the American female basketball player that is being used as mm -hmm. uh, some kind of a trading uh, card. Yeah. Is uh, Do you think Putin is involved with that, and this is just his way of poking us in the eye with a sharp stick, or is this part of a grand plan uh, of some sort? And the other question is, how do you suppose Putin looks at the Baltic states as he expands The Baltic himself? states. <laughs> we, I, worked, I worked in Estonia and in, in, in uh, Latvia, so I... <laughs> we have an, uh, well, okay, we have an Estonian connection here. I'm going to cut into it because it'll keep going otherwise. <laughs> um, it, let me take Estonia first. Uh, Putin, Putin was very... We talked about Putin's obsession um, about, about Ukraine. Um, he had a fixation about Ukraine. He also had a fixation on Estonia. And um, uh, I talked to a um, German consul um, who uh, was, was there right at the beginning, um, uh, the end of the Soviet Union, became the first amb ambassador to, German ambassador to Estonia. <coughs> and he, he remembered talking to Putin, and Putin being absolutely outraged that Estonia could dare to become independent. You know, this is part of our country, and particularly for people from St. Petersburg, which has always had very close links with um, under Sobchak, they, they started talking about is, is the fourth Baltic state, St. Petersburg. You know, they have very close ties. And going back to the early 20th century, we were talking about this earlier, um, the, the population of St. Petersburg, Estonian population was, of St. Petersburg, was bigger than the Estonian population of Tallinn. It was terrific. Um, so, yes, Putin felt very strongly about it. And when he was in St. Petersburg... Um, he was, he was not helpful, put it that way. <laughs> and the Estonian consul, in a young man, uh, Mark Piskop, I think his name was, um, who was, who was in St. Petersburg, who opened. The first consul had a nervous breakdown very quickly. The second consul, um, he told me, you know, he found death threats. Um, and in the morning when he got up and, and went into the office, he'd look under his car to make sure that no one had, a trap, had attached a bomb to it. It was very tough for the Estonians at that time because St. Petersburg people were, were furious. They had to get visas to go to Estonia, to their dachas. The organized crime people um, were, were absolutely infuriated because this was a big channel for you know, uh, smuggling through Estonia. So it was, um, yeah, it was a big issue. Your first question I have now conveniently forgotten. Oh, Brit Brit Brittany, Brittany Griner, yeah. Um, it's always useful to have hostages. You know, uh, I, I, I mean, I think it probably, I don't think Putin ordered it, but uh, yes, it fell into his lap quite nicely and it will be used sooner or later for, to get Victor Boot or uh, some of those other guys out who the Americans are holding. Um, and it's a, nice, it's a nice little bit of leverage. It's, it's Poor part, lady. It's part of the game. It's part of the game, yeah as it is with China. China's doing exactly the same sorts of things, I'm afraid. Um, sir. Thanks. I really appreciate your 
efforts to humanize Putin, it's sort of comforting in a way to, to think that he's a rational character rather than an irrational character. Um, and I guess my my question comes back to uh, this: your your revisionist history of this man's rise to power is reminiscent to me of the the new left um, of the the origins of the Cold War, and I wondered that that particular debate focuses on to what extent the Cold War was inevitable versus to what extent was it missteps by the uh, the West, the American foreign policy. So I'm wondering kind of where you come down on that question in relation to the rise of Putin and maybe even more particularly to the war. That is, was it, was it an inevitable or to what extent did the U.S. make, make fatal errors somewhere back in, it, you know, you mentioned Clinton, Baker um, in the early 90s. Um, I, 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 I don't consider my account to be revisionist. Um, uh, uh, it's not a word I'd use. Um, just to pick you up on the Cold War, no, I don't agree with the New Left stance at all. Um, the Cold War, I think, was inevitable. Um, and uh, one of the strongest grounds for, for saying that is what happened in Eastern Europe. Um, and the way that the, the Stalinist regime developed even before. No, I, I, so the Cold War, I don't think, was inevitable. Um, I'm, I, what, I'm, what I'm primarily saying about, about the US role is uh, that it's not being, uh, it's very difficult to find people here who acknowledge that perhaps uh, we didn't do everything exactly right. I haven't heard any official or, um, you know, say that. And I think, yeah, we didn't do everything exactly right. The Russians certainly didn't do everything right either. Um, and I think Bill Burns has it absolutely correct when he says this was a train wreck that was always going to happen. Because <laughs> if you have two partners, two powerful partners, who have very different visions of what their relationship should be, you have a you have a crash. Um, the, the crash, I do think, could have been managed otherwise. It didn't have to become a war in Ukraine. Uh, it would always have been a conflict, but it didn't have to become a war. But I'm not blaming the United <coughs> States. Um, uh, I'm tr rather trying to see how it happened, what the steps on each side were that led to it. But there was an... I often say, you feel it, you know, we're dealing with a Shakespearean tragedy when everyone can see that we're moving towards a disaster and everyone would like to stop it and no one knows how. And it just all goes terribly wrong. And that's fundamentally what happened. It's not, not a matter of blame, I think. Sir. Hi. Um, Hi. I just had two questions. Um, I'll just start with the first one. <clears throat> so I just um, had a question about uh, Putin's thinking in the lead up to his decision to invade. And uh, my question, the first question is that, um, would you say that, um, what would you say is Putin's perception of the U.S. and other NATO's countries' willingness um, and ability to respond and react to Russian actions? Um, and could you elaborate on what role that might have played in his decision to invade and what his decisions are going forward? You, 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 you say uh, inability to react. <coughs> are you thinking that, 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 that we couldn't stop it? I mean, the West was unable to stop Russia? No, I'm saying more so like what, what, do, you th what do you think Putin's understanding of the West's resolve is whenever they're dealing with um, Russian actions? by doing sanctions, moving troops closer to the border, um, bringing up the prospect of military engagement? How do you think Putin's understanding of what the West's limits are um, when they're engaging with the Russians has played into his decision to actually invade um, and carry out the war in the way that he has so far? Well, I think Biden, Joe Biden was very prudent and it was absolutely rational to say it before the invasion. Um, that uh, uh, this was that the United States would not intervene directly. 
because that is the way to a superpower clash, and they both have very large amounts of nuclear arms. And there, there is another element in this, which I'm, which I'm quite sure is in the back of everyone's mind in, in Washington. China is building a very substantial nuclear armory. So it's not just Russia anymore. But, um, and obviously, if Putin, if, if, if Biden says um, the United States is not going to intervene directly, um, that takes one important piece off the table. Um, I think Putin underestimated the extent to which the United States would intervene indirectly, particularly in the very early stages of the war. And I don't think he was expecting uh, the United States to make its intelligence um, findings as well known as it, as it did. That's, that's not the normal way it goes. So he had some, some surprises. Um, but basically, I think he felt, you know, I've got away with all my foreign policy initiatives so far. Uh, Georgia, I created frozen, haven't created them, but I ensured that they've kept going, the frozen co co conflicts in, in Georgia. <coughs> South Ossetia is still not part of Georgia and so on. Um, then uh, annexation of Crimea, then the eastern Donbass, then Syria, you know, the, Russia moved pretty successfully into uh, a gap that America, a vacuum that America had left in, in, in that part of the Middle East. That with all that followed by Afghanistan, he thought he would, America's resolve was not, was not strong, that America would not um, react vigorously. Um, you know, if you look back, uh, it's, a, it's a long train of things. You have extraordinary, you, Americans. America has extraordinary military force, uh, uh, much greater than anyone else. But if you look at how it's been used, if you look as a Russian, or even, I must confess, as, as many Europeans do, you think, well, you haven't used it very well. You know, Korea, okay, in Korea you had an armistice. <clears throat> Vietnam was not a great success. Iraq, I think most Europeans would say not a great success. Afghanistan, not a great success. You know, how many wars have you actually won? Um, sorry, I shouldn't be saying this. <laughs> but, but if you, I'm trying to explain how it would be seen from Moscow that, um, uh, yes, Putin would think he would, he would get away with it. And I think he's had a very nasty surprise that um, he says, Fighting to the last Ukrainian, okay, fine. But it's happening pretty effectively so far. Sorry. We're, uh, Phil, we're just about out of time. Um, ah. So I'm going to ask one question of you, just because I've grabbed the, the mic, uh, <laughs> seized power, I think, which is appropriate in this uh, context. <laughs> I'm going to ask you one question, and then uh, we'll, we'll wrap up. Uh, and I'll just say before I do that, again, uh, there are books available um, uh, outside those doors, and Philip will um, stick around for a while to sign them if you'd like to come up and, yes. and get that Guaranteed done. personal dedication, huh? <laughs> <laughs> My question is this. So uh, you've spent the better part of a career writing books about powerful, dangerous, despotic men, um, with a possible exception of Mitterrand, uh, which <laughs> you can explain he was later how he fits. <laughs> um, but do tell us why you do this, um, what, uh, you know, why this particular series of books you've written over uh, your career. And then, of course, what I assume I'm not the only one wondering, who is next <laughs> on the list and what will that say about him or, or possibly her? Well, why? Um, because they're all very, this is the link to Mitron as well, they're all very complicated people. Um, uh, Pol Pot, uh, Mao, certainly. Um, Pol Pot, uh, Mitron, uh, Putin. Um, they, none of them are, are simple. Um, and it, I find it much more interesting to deal with people. M you know, M Mao was kind of several, you know, Half a dozen different different characters rolled into one: uh, military strategist, poet, um, visionary, ideologist, and, and so on. Um, 
uh, Pol Pot was uh, very different. He, he, but, but he was a product of a, of a country, Cambodia, which is pretty paranoid, which has been frightened that it would, its existence would be wiped out by its two powerful neighbors, Thailand and, and Vietnam, and which really very nearly was not wiped out in the 19th century. <clears throat> so it's a, it's a very strange country. Um, uh, Mitron, well, France is a strange country too. <laughs> um, anyway, complicated people, each of whom is a sort of, is emblematic in some ways of, of their country's uh, uh, polity, pol politics and culture. <clears throat> and so when you're talking about Mao, you're talking about really a century of China. Same with Mitron. And Putin, I think, is also the same. Uh, I, you know, we were discussing this earlier. He's an authentic Russian. Um, he, he really does, as we were saying, you know, he, he is a reflection of the deeper aspirations, um, contradictions, um, failings, um, successes, and, and, and joys, uh, as well as horrors of Russia. And um, I, I, I found with Putin it is really fascinating to try and, and delve and see what, what was there. Um, I'm, I tell you, I'm not sure I'm going to do it at all. <laughs> so you're getting a, a, a kind of the, the prime revelation. I, I am interested in Xi Jinping as a, an imperator, a, a, maybe a despot, an autocrat, certainly, a red prince. Um, I think... I think that story is interesting, and it's where China is going now. You know, whether I do it or not, I don't know. <laughs> well, <it's... laughs> thank you. Thank you, Philip. Uh, thank you for your time and your insights. And of course, if uh, if that next book does come out, you have a, a place already booked here. Um, <laughs> come back and join us anytime. Thank you, Ben. Thank you very much. And thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.